Welcome to Applied Mathematical Finance. And yeah, before we go to the next uh, section, I would like to make a small concluding remark on our last section on multi-curve interest rate, yeah, calibration curve modeling. So um, what was the point there? So the point was that we defined interest rate curve to value linear products. So there were the discount curve here. Okay, so this gives us here the discount factor, the zero copper bond price. Okay, just defined as the value of getting one unit of currency at the payment time here. And there was the forward rate curve here defined. And then if you have defined these two objects, yeah, the value of paying an index or the value of paying a constant, then you can value all kind of linear products that are linear combinations of an index paid and um, a constant paid. We also had the remark that you can recover the classical theory if you uh, introduce uh, collateralization. So our valuation then relied on the fact that we have these curves here. And we had um, a session discussing how we could model these curves. So what are, well, interpolation methods for the points which we do not observe? And what is a nice interpolation entity? Yeah, so what should we in interpolate the value or say some transformed coordinate like the logarithm of the value? And I would like to conclude this discussion on curves with a small experiment showing you the impact of the interpolation method on the hedge ratio, on the sensitivity, on the hedge portfolio. So this is actually what a trader does. And the point is that the trader has some kind of, say, a little bit exotic product, but the market only provides a limited amount of products which we, he could use for his replication strategy. So if we consider interest rate products and if we look here at swaps, so then the market trades only a limited amount of, say, standardized swaps. So if we trade this swap, say, in time T0, then the market trades usually just the spot starting swap. So there is maybe some uh, convention that the swap will start in two days. So the schedule of that swaps, the uh, period discretization uh, is starting in say two business days, but it is spot starting in the sense that it starts in T0 plus uh, two business dates. So all the swaps that you can trade are in this sense, the standardized swaps, they are spot starting. Then the market trades usually par swaps. So this means that uh, you cannot ask, okay, I would like to have a swap that exchanges a forward rate, a floating rate. So we are exchanging a floating rate, say Li, yeah, fixed in Ti, against a constant, say a fixed rate, say K. You do not say, okay, I would like to have a swap that exchanges forward rate against 3%. What is the price of the swap? The usual way is that you say, I would like to have a swap that starts in two business days, has a maturity of five years. What is the corresponding fixed rate? So you trade a par rate swap. That means you get a fixed rate such that the value of this swap is zero. 
Okay, so that's actually nice because initially you never need to pay money for this financial product. You will just get a product that has value zero and they just quote uh, the fixed rate. Okay, so you say, I would like to have a five-year swap. Then he says, okay, you have to pay 3.2% on the fixed side. Yeah, Or if you do the other way around, you will receive 3.2% on the fixed side. So the market only trades uh, par swaps, spot starting par swaps. So uh, par rate swaps, spot starting par rate swaps. So the next thing is that we trade only selected maturities. Okay, so um, you do not get a swap that runs for six point five years. Yeah. Okay, and there is also some standard with respect to the frequencies yeah the quarterly semi annual yeah, swap the day count conventions on the fixed side and the floating rate side okay so now i have the problem that i would like to hatch a swap v that is not traded on the market so for example it could be that this swap is already running yeah it was a seven year swap but uh, half year has passed yeah so the maturity is in 6.5 years it is already running so it has maybe some uneven maturity it is a non pass swap yeah if it was traded in the past yeah maybe the swap rate has has moved so the fixed rate doesn't agree with the swap rate that we observe today um or well, you would like to have some kind of other exotic uh, change in, in the payoff. So I would like to hatch the swap. Hatching means I would like to neutralize the risk. Okay, by, yeah, how do I neutralize the risk? By setting up a replication portfolio. And it's a replication portfolio where we trade in the standardized market instruments so we buy these swaps si so maybe you remember that the replication portfolio the guy that is neutralizing the risk is just the linear combination of these products where the hedge ratio so the factors phi i are just the partial derivative of the value of the derivative you'd like to hedge with respect to the products that form the replication portfolio. So with respect to the SI here. Yeah? So I have that my replication portfolio is given by phi i is dv by dsi. Yeah, so question, how do you how do you calculate here the partial derivative? How does the value of this swap, this non-standard swap, depend on the value of the other swaps you observe? Of course, you can calculate this um, implicitly because um, assume that the value, assume that the value of your swap V is calculated with a certain model. Yeah? So there is a certain model M here. And that model depends on some model parameters, say R. Okay. And also the replication portfolio depends on some model we use to value the replication portfolio. And the model, again, also depends on these parameters R. Okay. Then what I actually like to do is I like to have that the change in value that I observe in V as a function of these model parameters agrees with the change of value in my replication portfolio as a function of these model parameters. Okay, and what I have on the right-hand side is actually the sum phi i, the change of value of my instruments that I observe which constitute the replication portfolio 
with respect to the R. So actually I can determine the phi I, the guy which we are looking for, by solving this equation. So phi I multiplied with ds by dr should be equal to dv by dr. Now you could also think that this is a little bit that we have the chain rule in place here. So if I have dv by ds, which I'm looking for, okay, then I can introduce dv by dr times dr by ds. Okay, so it's enough to calculate dv by dr and dr by ds, but dr by ds is the inverse of ds by dr. Yeah? So inverse means I solve this equation. This guy is also called the sensitivities. Yeah, because it, it tells me how sensitive is v with respect to a change in the observed value when the observed value determine my valuation model. So when I calibrate my valuation model to the observed standardized market rate swaps. So I can determine these sensitivities implicitly by calculating the partial derivative of all products with respect to my model parameters. So I define now the matrix A. A is ds by dr matrix because I have different products Si and different model parameters R1 to Rm. Well, if I would have a model that creates maybe a perfect fit to the market, then the N is maybe equal to M, I have one model parameter to fit one product that I observe on the market. In that case, A is yeah, hopefully invertible. So I define this matrix and I define the vector dV by dr. So how sensitive is my derivative product, my non-standard product, my non-standard swap in our case, with respect to the model parameters. And then I just solve the equation A times phi equals B to get my vector phi of sensitivities dV by dS. If A is invertible, this will be really the vector dV by dS. Otherwise, you could define some kind of pseudo inverse, yeah? uh, for example, just minimize the distance of A times phi to B yeah, with respect to a suitable norm. Okay, so then you do not have a perfect hedge, but you maybe minimize some kind of risk. Yeah? So if this here is some kind of L2 norm, yeah, you could have interpreted it as some um, yeah, root mean squared error that you have in your replication strategy. Consider just the case where A is invertible. Yeah, okay, so then phi is A inverse times B. You see there is a small transposed here. Okay, this transposed is because the way I'm writing it here is that this here is a column vector. Actually, a derivative, yeah, a gradient would be a row vector. And here, um, this here is the row, this is the column. Yeah. So formally, actually, I have to apply here a transposed. But okay, so you should uh, know what's the right uh, dimension. Yeah. So if you just write it here with a sum, yeah, okay, so you see it's uh, clear what you what you what you multiply. Yeah? The phi i is multiplied with the derivative of d s i d r k. Okay, so um you can do this, and I just did this. Yeah, so uh, I have a set of uh, thirty swaps with 
say, some standard maturities. Actually, here you see some guys are here missing. Yeah, there's a guy missing here. Um, okay, so I have some standardized swap. I have a curve that has the corresponding number of parameters. And now I would like to calculate a swap that is not in my discretization, so that is not observed on the market, and that is not um, yeah, having a corresponding interpolation point in my curve. So I would like to replicate a swap that has a maturity of 6.5 years. I do this by looking at two different interpolation methods. So I compare here the linear interpolation and the cubic spline interpolation. Not on the slides, I do this on the logarithm of the zero copper bond price. Okay, so I take the logarithm of the zero copper bond price as the interpolation um, entity, and I just check what is the phi, what is the correct replication portfolio. So first observation, I'm doing a linear interpolation of a swap that has a maturity of 6.5 years. So it's just in between. So 6.5 is here. Okay, so just in between the two maturities, so the two maturities which are traded on the market are six years and seven years. And what you see is that, yeah, you should buy no other swap beyond seven years. Yeah, do not buy eight year, do not buy nine year, no other swap below the six years, yeah, do not buy five years, do not buy four years. You should buy two swaps. 50% should be six year and 50% should be seven year. Huh? So like one would expect, huh? uh, you see that I buy a little bit more from the seven year swap. This depends a little bit on the way we interpolate, actually, if you change from log of the zero comma bond price to another interpolation entity, you will see small changes here in the weight to the two uh, financial products. So this is my replication portfolio. Yeah. So this is here the phi i, which which we calculate. Okay. So this here is the function phi i, yeah, where actually i is the maturity of the swap. What happens if I switch to a cubic spline interpolation? So you see here, it's very nicely localized. Yeah, so there's no interference to other maturities. If I switch to a cubic spline interpolation, you know, cubic spline is smoothening the way yeah, the curve interpolates observed values, but this smoothening, yeah, so this nice feature of the cubic spline has the effect that observation to products nearby influence the value of the other product. So this means that a financial product that lies, for example, here with a four-year maturity has a dependency on a financial product with um, with a five-year uh, maturity because if that moves, okay, maybe I would like to smooth something. Uh, so it has this dependency because also these swaps here are semi-annual. Yeah? So always in that payment, there is some 
value picking up the interpolated values. It's not only the observed values, but also the interpolated value that enter into the valuation of the financial product. For our question, what is the replication portfolio for this 6.5 year swap? So the guy that is here in between, I now get the answer that I should buy 60% of the neighboring swaps. So it is much more. Yeah? So maybe the interpolation is overemphasizing yeah, this dependency. But then I should compensate this movement yeah, with some minus 10% of the neighboring swaps, the five-year and the eight-year guy, yeah? So recall, this year is the six-year, this year is the seven-year, this year is the five-year, this year is the eight-year. Okay, so um, it's also in a solution. Yeah? It's a perfect replication portfolio, but a trader would not like this yeah? because actually the trader now has to buy four financial products. Actually, he has to buy even more because then there is another recompensation on the other side and there's another one. Yeah, So actually he would buy not only four, he would buy two additional ones here yeah, and maybe two additional ones there. So it would be eight yeah? or even more. Yeah, they are small noise here. Um, so he doesn't like this. And also, I mean, to some extent, he's he's buying a little bit too much here to offset this then. Okay, just an effect from the interpolation method. Right? So you see how um, severe this this choice yeah, of choosing here this cubic spline interpolation could um, alter the choice of this um, replication portfolio. So maybe the trader would be yeah would be much more efficient with this little bit simplification in the model, which makes it a little bit more robust. So this stuff here is actually calculated off a little experiment. So um, we will do this as an exercise. So I do not share the code yet. Yeah. So, but you see, I have here a little experiment that just plots this replication portfolio. So if you run this, yeah, so you can generate these two uh, plots and you also see the vectors, the replication portfolio vectors here. So you see for linear is a 10 to the minus four, almost always here. So until we have the two financial products, which we should use in our hedge, and then it's even 10 to the minus 16. Yeah. So it's really a zero. So you see there's no influence of the values that come after into into this uh, question of what is the replication portfolio. For the cubic spline, yeah, you see maybe a 10 to the minus four first, but then you see some noise is picking up, it's oscillating, it's creating oscillations. Yeah, you see this overshooting here to 60%, and you even have some values on the buckets after the maturity uh, of the product at which we look at. Okay, so that was um, that was it for my uh, little section on session on the curves. I just wanted to show you this small numerical experiment yeah, because it's maybe uh, a bit impressive that such a trivial thing as a, a interpolation method yeah, can have such a, a strong um, impact on, on on what the trader will see. That was it for this.